suffer so much. I think we cannot fool, at the end, our own souls. The woman I referred to above knew, deep within, that she was psychically dead, that her I, capital letter I, hardly existed. The suffering individual tries to provide more and more explanations to keep his suffering at bay. Either the suffering leaks through anyway, or the explanations become so tangled or extreme, which then cause additional suffering. But if we listen to the stories of people whose suffering has reached psychotic proportions, they regularly tell us that they are struggling with the very existence of their personal identities. Schriever, Sigmund Freud's famous patient, talked about soul murder. A schizophrenic man talked about having, quote, no nucleus, no central self. Another said, quote, gradually I can no longer distinguish how much of myself is me and how much is in others. I'm a conglomeration, a monstrosity modeled anew each day. The narratives of psychotic person, people often tell us a great deal about the experience of a greatly diminished or even absent capital letter I. Psychotic people often complain of time standing still, for instance. Julian Jaynes uh, explained this, saying, quote, another way the dissolving of mind space, that's his word for the, the uh, contraction of a sense of I. The, the way that the dissolving of mind space shows itself is the disorientation in respect to time so common in the schizophrenic. We can only be conscious of time as we can arrange it into a spatial succession. And the diminishing of mind space to schizophrenics makes this difficult or impossible. In other words, they can't order because the reference point is either uh, so small or so hidden or not there, or not there enough. Jane's mind space is the internal space where the I resides. The schizophrenic tries to tie all, many answers to ex, or explanations to external circumstances. So, and what's this? So when the schizophrenic says he's commanded by outside forces, the psychiatrist regards it as a delusion, which is defined as a falsification of reality. But Jaynes says, quote, with the loss of the eye or the mind space, the ability to narrate behavior either responds to hallucinated uh, directions or continues, uh, hallucination of course would then be also external, or continues on by habit. The remnant of self feels like a commanded automaton. Now, what I wish to emphasize that none of these, or I do wish to emphasize, I should say, that none of these experiences are referred, uh, that I've referred to are exclusive at all to people suffering from schizophrenia or uh, another psychosis. If we look at people who suffer, for instance, excessive fear or anxiety, we see similar phenomena. Anx anxious individuals are afraid, sometimes even of going out of the house. Uh, as if the uh, lightning will strike or some event will get them, something from the outside. If you ask them what they are afraid of, they'll always tell you that it's external circumstances. They fear personal catastrophe. Uh, and at the bottom, the personal catastrophe is again the, the loss of self or the loss of I. This is the catastrophe that people falling into schizophrenia feel as what's left of their, quote, mind space in James's terms erodes. Anorexia or anorexics experience uh, similar processes. It's difficult, actually nearly impossible, to persuade an anorectic to give up what she calls, quote, control, her rigid dieting. But what's she controlling? Ask an anorectic and you'll get exactly the same answer, an overwhelming anxiety of personal disaster, the terror of loss of self. The struggle with anorexia or the struggle that is anorexia, usually begins in adolescence, as does schizophrenia, and for the same reason. It's at this time of life that one begins to enter adulthood in the larger world. So it's no wonder that the experience of self-dissolution occurs at that time. Anorexics, excessive anxiety, schizophrenia, these are not different diseases. These are different syndromes that reflect different responses to exactly the same problem. Now, in order to demonstrate what the, the loss of self, I want to tell you a story. It's a story of a patient that I treated, uh, a woman by the name of Catherine Penny. I can name her because she's the subject of uh, a book that we wrote together uh, called Dante's Cure. 
which was published uh, last year by uh, other press um, after 53 rejections, uh, uh, by the way. <laughs> now, Catherine completely recovered from severe schizophrenia through psychotherapy alone. There were no medications used of any kind other than some aspirin and um, uh, other anti-inflammatories for um, a, 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 some muscle ache she had for carrying her head down so low. But I want to tell you about her uh, because she so clearly demonstrates what we're talking about in the loss of eye, and it also demonstrates what two people can do together to restore that or affirm uh, that process of eye development. Catherine's treatment lasted nearly eight years. I um, saw her for six days a week uh, during her uh, first uh, three and a half year hospitalization. I first met Catherine when she was brought to UCLA Hospital. I was a resident in psychiatry in the first year, and I vividly remember the first time I, I met her uh, over uh, a three year period prior to my meeting her, uh, she started hallucinating. Um, hearing voices at age 18 uh, that said, kill your mother, kill your mother. Uh, she withdrew into a shell. She was always a shy girl. She was very symbiotically attached to her own mother. Uh, when I first, uh, they, she had been hospitalized twice. She'd been on uh, these horrid medications that uh, Grace talked about, that, um, that she was, these were the old time medications, Thorazine and Stelazine. They did absolutely nothing other than somehow quiet things to the point where she heard her voices out at a distance. But they didn't make things go away. She continued to withdraw. She, developed, she uh, undertook a draconian diet. Uh, she was 120 pounds, five foot five, uh, high school girl. And what she uh, did was she went on, a, on this uh, diet and lost uh, virtually, she lost 20 pounds in about six weeks and continued to lose weight. She weighed just under 100 pounds when her mother brought her to UCLA at the suggestion of a very kind social worker who uh, was conducting a group and recognized that Catherine uh, couldn't benefit from that. Um, what Catherine had done in the years, uh, two years before I met her, uh, she withdrew to the point where she could not uh, even complete high school. She was allowed to complete high school because at the, really, at the, for the kindness of, the, um, of her teachers, she just sat in class with her head down on her chest. She developed strange rituals. They weren't, uh, I'm going to say strange, but all of this has an explanation, and Catherine provided that to me uh, after her recovery, which was a remarkable chance uh, to, for uh, both uh, doctor and patient uh, to collaborate with, and discover, uh, from my point of view, what went wrong. She. Uh, uh, would stay on her knees for all day long in front of a little small homemade altar uh, with pictures of saints uh, on the wall and a statue of Jesus with his arms outstretched in front. Uh, she also uh, walked on her knees uh, over the gravel in the backyard surrounding a little one of those little California kid kidney pools um, and until her knees bled much in the manner of the uh, uh, worshippers at, uh, I believe it's Fatima in Portugal, she fashioned herself uh, uh, trying to achieve forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness because her voices told her to kill uh, members of her family, uh, her mother and her sister. When I met her, uh, all I saw was this mass of uh, hair hanging down over uh, her head. Uh, she hardly responded. Her mother said she needed hospitalization. Uh, I asked her, uh, if she herself thought she should be in the hospital. And all she said was, I need to be in a hospital. Now, I, as a first year resident, uh, I had done a lot of reading in, uh, in psychiatry. One of the books I read was Peter Bragan's book. Um, what was your first book? Uh, it was the- well, Toxic is probably no, the one No, I didn't. Uh, yes, it was. It was Toxic Psychiatry. Um, I'd also read a great deal of uh, the people Ann Silver talked about, uh, Harry Stack Sullivan, uh, uh, 
uh, and particularly Frieda Fromm Reichmann's little book, uh, Principles of Intensive Psychotherapy. I also read a lot of the history of psychiatry, and I knew that medications, even in those uh, years, uh, were n only a cover-up. So I started seeing Catherine six days a week in psychotherapy. Um, I was under enormous pressure from the staff uh, to medicate her. Uh, I was accused in open staff meetings of uh, uh, being cruel and of not uh, following the Hippocratic Oath because the Hippocratic Oath said I was obliged to relieve her pain. Uh, other residents uh, uh, accused me of being as the crazy doctor because, uh, quote, he thinks he can talk to schizophrenics. Uh, he's as nutty as his patients. Um, and uh, that, uh, luckily, though, I had a, a ward chief who allowed me to continue. Uh, um, Catherine lost weight down to 84 and a half pounds. We put a, a ceiling of 85, and she responded at 84 and a half. Don't tell me she wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> she was there. Uh, uh, she also um, uh, um, worsened during the, her three and a half year hospitalization. She was hospitalized for my full residency. Um, I hold the uh, record at UCLA uh, for the length of time patients are in the hospital. Uh, uh, it hasn't been broken since. Um, I had two schizophrenic patients I saw six days a week uh, for my entire residency. Um, the uh, powers above me threatened to uh, discharge her over my head, and I said, well, go ahead. Um, uh, said, well, look, uh, uh, you're here. Uh, this is not a chronic care hospital. I said, no. Uh, but it's a teaching hospital, yeah? Uh, <laughs> uh, and so what I did is challenge the uh, people above me to uh, discharge her over my head, which would have created a terrible ruckus. Uh, so they didn't. Um, but uh, now Catherine sat uh, in uh, my office and on the ward in a catatonic position with uh, hallucinating. She would go into the day room and she uh, would sit, put her head down on her chest, and she shut down to such an extent that she didn't even swallow uh, her own saliva. It drooled out all over the front of her. She wore a, kind of an old print house dress. And it drooled out all over the front of her dress and dripped off the hem into a puddle on the floor. She refused to bathe. Uh, she wouldn't talk much, except for wheedling complaints about life on the ward. Um, now, our sessions were for the first two years, uh, uh, about 80 to 90 percent silent, uh, and she, she worsened. I would muse about how she uh, got there, um, what might be going on. Uh, she later told me, now she, uh, uh, I haven't told you yet, uh, well, I told you that she recovered in the title, so uh, she told me later that one of the early things that I said to her was, uh, uh, she said, quote, it caused an antenna to go up. Um, and I mused aloud, um, gee, uh, I wonder why you're so much into yourself like that. Uh, perhaps it's for safety. Uh, you know, the world can be a pretty scary place. She told me that one comment uh, caused her to put up an antenna uh, to begin to think that uh, something was different here than being labeled. Um, she nevertheless, some of the things that she said during the, uh, the, the uh, when she did speak, they were in, only in single sentences and usually a complaint. And uh, sometimes that complaint, maybe 15, 20 percent of the time, besides where can I store certain food and can I have this kind of food and do I have to go to the activities deck, uh, was, look, uh, she, she would say, can I have a pill? Uh, everybody else gets pills. And uh, I would reply, I did reply, uh, well, you know, I, I think you've had pills and it didn't do much. Uh, let's try another way. She would sit in silence, kneading her fingers, uh, 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 and uh, during one of the silences, she blurted out, this was two years after treatment started, she'd say, um, <laughs> why don't you just get up and leave? Um, and uh, I, I didn't. I, we, I finished 50-minute hours, uh, oftentimes sitting in silence. After, uh, she clo after about a year and a half, she well, it was less than that, about a year, she closed her eyes. 
and walked around the ward with her head down on her chest in a sh really strange shuffling gait, uh, all the while kneading her hands uh, and not looking at anything. Um, I asked her why she shut her eyes, and she said, uh, I don't deserve to see anything. Um, now, let me tell you a little about the nature of uh, therapy here because, uh, um, well, let me uh, tell you the, um, perhaps the long run, and then uh, I'll talk about some of the details of what went on and how I see uh, uh, the critical nature of the, nat of the person's self or what I was doing and how I related to her. The, um, uh, after three and, three and a half, uh, after I finished my residency, uh, Catherine, I transferred Catherine to a private mental hospital. In fact, uh, I, um, if Ann Silver's here, it was actually a CPC hospital, uh, the, the company that bought Chestnut Lodge. Um, <laughs> uh, they uh, also gave me a hard time about uh, not uh, having her on medication, but since it was a private hospital, uh, and uh, her, Catherine's uh, treatment, by the way, her entire treatment was paid for by the federal government. In those days, if uh, you were the child of a military officer, her natural father was uh, killed in Korea as an officer, and uh, she became schizophrenic and was so diagnosed prior to age 21 that entitled her to lifetime benefits. And being seen on a fee-for-service basis, by the way, um, uh, and uh, including paying for her hospitalization. Nowadays, of course, that's all contained within the VA system. Um, uh, I should also... Uh, uh, tell you just a moment that I once calculated the uh, uh, cost of Catherine's treatment because I'm often asked that at, the, the, at talks like this. Uh, well, who can afford this kind of thing? And in 1975 dollars, uh, Catherine's uh, cost of uh, treatment um, uh, was uh, saved the uh, U.S. taxpayer a quarter of a million dollars. Um, she, and that doesn't include the fact that uh, Catherine fully recovered and is a contributing member of, the, uh, of society. But it was paid for by the government at that time. I transferred her to a private hospital. And once in the private hospital, she was there about uh, close to three months when one day she looked up at me and, um, with her eyes closed and uh, raised her head up and it did, did this and looked around. It was the first time I'd seen her uh, eyes in a, a bit over two years. Um, I asked her what was going on. She said, I want to, quote, see, end quote, the world. Um, now, I'll, I want to get to what actually happened in, in her treatment because that's critical for uh, what I'm trying to get across here. Uh, she uh, went on with a great deal of help from uh, the social work community. Uh, we hired a social worker to help her reintegrate. She uh, left the hospital, um, had a great deal of, uh, of uh, trouble regaining her sense of balance, psychological balance. She, she, f she thought and felt in a very concrete way. She got extremely depressed. She said, I'll never catch up. Uh, it's not possible to catch up with all of this uh, being behind. Um, she, uh, at the, just about prior to the, I should say about six months prior, six, eight months prior to opening her 